Colleagues, I would like to propose we start soon. Thanks. Good. Both. Let's start it because we're short on time. Yeah, exactly. Um, colleagues, let's start. I know some of you would perhaps like to go for lunch, but now we have to sit here together. Uh, Is it ready? We need the screen. Sorry. We need the screen or it's okay like this. Okay, good. Welcome, welcome to all of you. Um, I'm very happy to, to, to moderate different private sector ambition, action and accountability towards food systems transformation. Where are we now and where do we need to go next? I'm yet exhausted by the title, but I think it's extremely important topic um, today for us. This site event um, today um, is sponsored by uh, the International Agri Food Network in collaboration with AGRA. Thanks also Agnes yet to be here. WBCSD, Diane, I saw you. Thanks for being um, thanks for being here and the Zero Hunger Pledge. Um, today we will review. I think uh, since two days we are here and listening what is happening, but I think it's also important to review what we have perhaps yet done and what companies have concretely done because there can be questions marked also about what's the involvement um, of the companies. And I think we all agree the high impact of investments in countries is recognized. And, and, and perhaps some of you, you read also the Ceres 2030 report where it's really emphasized um, all starts also um, with, um, with the um, investment which can track then um, concretely solutions on the ground um, to decrease um, hunger. Um, today, we will review, therefore, the progress in the implementation of the private sector commitment made in two years ago and discuss um, some also additional options. And I think we should keep the discussion also open today and to think about additional options and about perhaps future opportunities of mobilizing the private sector towards impactful action. Because I think the private sector is only about impact. The private sector is about building win-win situation. The private sector is about building also sustainable business models at the end, which have a positive impact on SDGs, but also on decreasing um, hunger. Um, we will also address how the private sector is advancing, therefore, um, on the zero hunger goal and the sustainable transforming food system. The Zero Hunger Pledge was launched in um, 2021, and I will not give the latest figure now, but just to remind you, at that time, we had a pledge of $345 million two years back. Later on, um, we will provide you with the latest figures, and I think it's impressive to see it's con constantly increasing. And I think we will hear also perhaps some new figures shared by one of the panelists today um, of companies who are still starting to contribute also um, to, this, um, to this pledge. Um, we have um, investments in 10 different areas and in 47 countries. The pledge is also committed to ensure that pledges led, and I think that's important because it's about impact, it's stock taking. And perhaps sometimes in the whole discussions during the last two days, we forgot it's a stock taking. That means it's somehow also assessing what was really done and what should be do. And, and therefore it's also, um, we would like um, to review um, what was done. We, you can also see that there are 13 stories, I think on the webpage of the Zero Hunger Pledge where you see concrete um, examples. Um, They've been showcasing examples, but I think what is also important to take stock of progress since the launch of the pledge is leading its first reporting process. 
And I think that's also important for all of you to, to put you on the same page. That means currently it's under review and it's just finalized its accountability framework. And this will be, I think, published end of this year. And I think that's an important moment. That's concretely you see also um, in, in terms of results um, and impact. The Zero Hunger Pledge is jointly led by multilateral organizations um, and international NGOs, including FAO, IFAB, um, WFP, Grow Africa, Grow Asia, Gain, Chamber Center uh, for Food and Climate, WBA, and WBCSD. Um, today, we have a distinguished high-level panel of speakers, and I think we're all excited to listen, but I think it's also important that you make your comments and remarks uh, what is happening. Um, we will have the wonderful opportunity also, Agnes, you will conclude our discussion, but please step in whenever you have um, any remark or concern about the private sector um, to, share, to share it with you. So normally I would give the floor now to Beth Bestel, but she has still some commitments and therefore um, we will now directly go uh, to concrete examples um, of companies um, who pledged or who are starting to pledge in the whole process. I will very quickly present the, the three speakers here and I would ask them then really to also explain what is the company, what the company stands for, also the footprint, and then explain why, why you are participating in this pledge and what are you also looking for. First of all, we have Dr. Leonardus Vergutz, which is the Chief Innovation Officer of the OECP group here. Thanks to be with us, Leonardus. We have uh, Ms. Asia Hietavo, which is the Group Vi Vice President of Tetra Pak. And we have uh, Gabriela Wurzel, who is the Multilateral Affairs Director of FMC Corporation, and I think since recently also Vice Chair of um, the Food and Agriculture Committee business at OECD. With this, I'm now happy to start to listen also to um, the companies, to their engagement. And Leonardo, if you would, you would like to start to provide us some insights on your companies yes. and then also to go into some re reasons why you are participating in the whole. Thank you very much, Mike. Michael. Thank you very much, everybody, ladies and uh, gentlemen. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today discussing these uh, such important topics, which again, uh, uh, bringing more sustainable food systems and sustainable agricultural systems to the, to the world. So I'm representing here today OCP. OCP company is a leading fertilizer company. So we are based in Morocco, but we sell our fertilizers, our uh, solutions, our nutrients everywhere in the world. We have a worldwide uh, footprint and uh, we are based on, on Mor in Morocco. We have uh, more than 70% of the known reserves of phosphorus. And we are uh, 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 safely and in a very responsible way uh, using and then managing these resources in a way to provide nutrients and food security everywhere uh, in the world. So as OCP, again, uh, it's, uh, it's very important to be here uh, these two days, as uh, Michael was saying, so listening, everybody talking about soil health and about farmers. So this is an important component. Uh, if we're gonna change anything in the food systems, we're gonna do this through these major actors, which again, they are uh, the farmers. So it's a, I'm very glad to keep here, to be here discussing about all these things and see the farmers taking their, uh, their uh, share on all these uh, discussions that we have been having. So one thing that we have to remember all the time is that uh, again, if we are here today well nourished is because we have them, it's because we have agriculture. And uh, the issue that we are facing now is that agriculture is one of the major sectors emitting greenhouse gas emissions. So nowadays everybody see agriculture as an important component of the climate issues that we have been facing. But at OCP, we truly believe that we can transform this and then changing food systems, changing agricultural systems, making them more sustainable, it's not an option, but it's really our way forward. So we have to make it happen, otherwise there's no other way. So in this sense, when we look into agriculture now, so we are emitting with agriculture more than one quarter of all the greenhouse gas emissions every single year. Uh, what is uh, everybody sometimes talk about in a negative way, this is actually a great opportunity that we have. So we can change this, we can change agriculture, we can decrease the greenhouse gas emissions. And on the top of that, we have another great challenge and great opportunity, which is we have a huge, uh, a huge storage room 
for carbon, which is uh, which are our soils. So once we change, when we can decrease the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and start to sequester this carbon in the soil, then we can make agriculture net negative. And this is actually our way forward. What does as OCP, what we have been doing in this sense? So we have been having a lot of different actions uh, worldwide, but particularly in Africa, which is uh, something that we have, uh, we are an African company, uh, company, and then we have this big footprint, and then we, we take by heart that we need to make Africa work. Uh, nowadays, we have a vicious cycle of poverty and land degradation. The poverty of the soils does not allow these farmers to produce enough food. They come, they try to produce food one, two, three years, where they end up depleting the soils. When they do this, they cannot produce anything anymore, they change. So then they leave a track behind, which is land degradation. This poverty of the soil translates into this land degradation. So closing yield gaps, it's one of the most important things that we can do in order to solve these issues. If we can produce more sustainable intensification, bringing the right inputs, we can save all this land from the deforestation, which is actually responsible for one third of all the emissions that we have uh, from agriculture sector. So closing yield gaps, it's a very important one. Greening our energy matrix. So we need to reduce the carbon footprint of the energy we use in agriculture. For these at OCP, now we are committed by 2027, we're gonna be bringing 1 million tons of green ammonia to the market. Ammonia produced only from a uh, renewable source of energy, mostly solar. At the same time, when we bring all these inputs that they're especially important into these poor soils, we, are, uh, we need to bring them on the right way. This is why we advocate and we develop the science around the four Rs, not only bringing the nutrients on the right way, but also bringing the right nutrients. If we have access to nutrients, it's because they come from the plants, transforming them into a delicious thing that we are eating now and having access to these, uh, to these uh, nutrients. And on the top of that, when we bring all these uh, sustainable agricultural practices, we can sequester and increase carbon in the soil which is again a big, we talk about all this insurance these last days here. This is a big insurance for the farmers. This is gonna make agriculture more resilient. So when we sum all of this, we're gonna have this uh, new type of food system, sustainable agriculture systems that we are looking for. At OCP, we are mapping 30 million hectares all around Africa. We are bringing customized solutions that we have been improving productivity by more than 200% in some of these agricultural systems. At the same time, we are increasing uh, carbon sequestration in the soil. So, and then just to, to finalize, so we are truly committed that we can, not only as an option, but we can combine SDGs two and 13 together. So we're gonna ensure food security at the same time, agriculture is our big tool to save and to fight climate change. I'm gonna stop here and then uh, we can continue with it. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Yeah, thanks so much, Ernest. I think very impactful. And I like a lot. I think that's a business perspective to see not only the challenges, but to see the opportunities. I think we are too much speaking about what we are facing as challenges. I think we are able to overcome them and to see this also as opportunities. Now we are coming to Tetra Park. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the difference is also um, that Tetra for the moment did not participate in the pledge itself. That you means I will it. not raise the pressure on you now to announce something. <laughs> But um, I'm pretty much sure perhaps you will join me I, I've soon. been approached already, so I yeah. think we'll Here we are. Uh, fix That's it good. Uh, probably. Um, but I think the interesting one is therefore for us to listen to you, how, how you engage also in, in regenerative agriculture, what you're doing um, there and and do you have specific projects also because you're here also for three days on yeah the food systems transformation, how you see uh, you were all there, and and again, we will be delighted to listen soon or to get soon information on any platform site. Very good. So, first of all, pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, and about Tetra Pak, maybe a few words, uh, because I think many of you know the milk cartons that you may be pouring a bit of milk to your coffee every morning, uh, but uh, not everybody knows that we are one of the world's largest food processing technology and equipment companies, as well as packaging solutions. So just to put the scale out, uh, there's more than 100,000 uh, processing units used by our customers like Nestle or, or others uh, around the world. So we fit quite nicely into the, the food value chain in the middle and can have an enabling role uh, in, in many cases because many of our, or well, most of our customers, they are local. A lot of them are small, medium sized. Uh, we are predominantly in the we have traditionally been predominantly in the dairy sector, which adds uh, to opportunities uh, for sustainable development. 
And maybe to start off with, um, I'd like to um, share our company's journey, what happened in the past two years, because this is a stock take. Uh, so two years ago, uh, we, as most private sector companies, we were not able to come to the, the summit because, uh, because obviously there was a uh, well, there was COVID and, uh, and there were challenges, um, uh, but in, in any case, we uh, participated virtually and we put together this uh, discussion paper, which was about the pathways that our type of companies, what Tetra Pak could be doing uh, and, and, and how, how the stakeholders uh, would see uh, our role in this uh, ecosystem. We, we, got the, we shared it with about 200 um, uh, external stakeholders. And now over the two, two past years, we've been working in areas uh, to see how we can take this forward. And we've actually identified four pathways where we as a company are committed and we will come up with targets. And we call it, the, at least the working name is the food positive program in our company. And these are all Pro, uh, areas where we really look uh, looking look uh, forward to partnering. So the first one, uh, the first pathway is is really related to more responsible dairy. We believe in 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 the dairy proteins that they are needed in the future as well. But of course, there's a lot to be done uh, in in the sustainability areas uh, around the dairy sector. And we've started collaboration. Uh, actually with the press release was out a couple of uh, days ago uh, with the global dairy platform where we have uh, established a task force to specifically uh, decarbonize uh, the processing part of uh, the dairy industry. The second area is, is about healthy diets uh, for a healthy planet. And there we're really happy with this year, we joined the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And, and it's really great to uh, represent also, also this platform here. And, and for instance, that uh, area where um, we have uh, collaboration in, in the areas of diversification and protein. So that's one big uh, area for our company. And we also started a new business uh, unit specifically looking at alternative process, uh, proteins and the whole technology around that so we uh, work together with uh, with a lot of startups um, in in this area and and also uh, other stakeholders research uh, organizations etc the third area is about uh, reduction of food uh, loss and waste in in the value chain where again technology can play a substantial role we also have new initiatives and new technologies to to actually valorize some of the food waste in the processing uh, so for instance in the brewery uh, you know waste you, you have actually high protein uh, waste which can then uh, the spent uh, grains can be can be used for new drinks and and there's a lot of uh, other alternatives already in the dairy sector we've uh, innovated a lot in this area and the fourth area is is really about uh, providing further access to nutritious uh, food uh, in low and, and middle income countries uh, also through technology uh, through smaller scale processing units where possible uh, and then through uh, aseptic packaging which is what we are famous for so this is packaging which actually preserves food for a longer period of time and and you can safely deliver um you know proteins and and other things to to um, individuals in this country so these are the four areas that we've uh, we've kind of come up with um and 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 in all these areas um also in the food loss and waste, we've partnered now with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, which has a platform for circular food. Uh, in the in the in the last part, we we hope to partner more broadly uh, on the uh, on projects uh, uh, on the ground in the developing world uh, in in context of uh, the nu nutritional uh, food and and access. And and I actually wanted to share a very specific example from from that area as as something that we have evolved also on uh, over the over the two years. So I have a colleague here who is filming there eagerly, uh, who is part of uh, our food for development unit, which is a unit. Uh, that we actually uh, created uh, about 20, 23 years ago. And there's two areas that we work on, uh, which are both very relevant for this discussion. One is that uh, we've been, we have a global team that uh, helps work on the ground uh, at, at national level uh, with governments on the, on the food, uh, um, sort of the school food um, or meal, school meal programs, um, where we have uh, gained quite a lot of expertise. We have guidance and we've worked with FAO and others in, in that domain. And we have evolved from just the very specific, simple uh, dairy products now to also look into, into more developed, um, uh, more nutritious uh, solutions in, in shape of porridges, et cetera, because we also have globally in different uh, regions, we have product development centers where we, with local food and beverage companies, we develop uh, 
uh, we help them develop products and we bring in partners to for ingredients for fortifications etc and as an example of of these uh, uh, these kind of new newer initiatives uh, we have one collaboration in Kenya which was just kicked off quite recently which is quite uh, exciting so it's in a region uh, where, where there's really heavily heavily heavy issues uh, with uh, malnutrition and the government was uh, very uh, very concerned about the fact that children are actually 90% of children don't go to school so with the kind of nutritional new types of uh, uh, nutrition uh, in in the school meal programs uh, they hope uh, to actually impact education and together with DSM and uh, the local uh, food food company um, as as well as uh, other partners and and the government uh, we developed this uh, what we call a super porridge it's uh, obviously a bit of a ridiculous brand name but in any case uh, this is one of the the kind of the new things that we look to to scale up and and this we see also as a collaboration opportunity you know with many many of the stakeholders hopefully here as well so that's just as an example yeah, thank you so much. I think, um, and I see a lot of opportunities perhaps to bring this also into these different national pathways, which exactly. are discussed here. Very this good. could be another, this could be another, because also the sale pledge is here to support also national pathways. And I think here we are exactly in, in this one. We are waiting for your co-soon <laughs> pronounce to announce the uh, commitment. Thank you so much. Um, Gabriela. Now, I think it's moment also for an announcement, if I understand well, um, and I think we are all happy to listen. To, to you, also what you will announce, but also concretely what FMC is doing and how you are engaged. Thanks again. Sure. Thank you, Michael, and thanks to the organizers for having me here. Um, I work for a company called FMC, which is an agricultural sciences company. In, in practice, this means that we work with growers, farmers all around the world to help them fight the pests that can seriously harm their crops or, or even destroy them. We are um, an innovation company. We are one of the top five R&D companies in our space. Uh, we, we develop research and develop chemical and biological products. And we are very, um, very concerned about sustainability. So we look very closely at the sustainability of our products, but also at what we do ourselves. And to give you a concrete example, we have a very ambitious commitment to go net zero in all three scopes, one, two, and three, by 2030. So this is really, I think, one of the most ambitious uh, targets uh, in ever, and it, they have been, they have been um, uh, approved by SPTI, and so this is real, this is science-based, and we are working very, very hard to, to make this happen. And because we work with the, those who produce food, so the farmers, we see them every day struggling and working very hard to bring food not only to their families and their tables, but also to many countries around the world. And so when we see that this food doesn't get to everybody around the world, that many people around the world still go to bed hungry, we find this outrageous and, and frankly unacceptable because we feel that companies like ours, especially innovation companies, have the obligation, but also the capacity to do something about it, to contribute in a, in a real, in a concrete way. Mike spoke about impact. And we feel we, we have this obligation and, and, this, and this capacity. And so this is where the, the zero hunger pledge comes into play, because what this initiative allows is for companies to pledge real, concrete initiatives in an accountability framework. And, and we just heard that they, they will announce this accountability framework. So we, we companies need to actually follow up on, on what they want. And one of the interesting things that really appealed to me when I was first discussing with the organizers was that they wanted real business investment. They wanted something which can scale up and have and have an impact. So I'm very proud to be announcing that FMC is pledging 30.5 million to support uh, smallholder farmers around the world, to support rural women and youth, and also on investment on climate smart technologies to help improve productivity and resilience. So these investments will take place, are taking place in 11 countries around the world, in, in all three regions, Latin America, Asia, and Africa. So 
maybe you are wondering, so what kind of investments we are uh, talking about? So I'd like to give you a, a few examples. Um, Smallholder farmers, this is really, everybody talks about them, but I think there is not that much being actually done. Everybody knows about the importance of smallholder farmers. It is estimated that about one third of food is produced by smallholder farmers around the world, but they don't necessarily get access to the latest technologies, innovation, finance, either because they are too small and nobody cares or because these technologies are too expensive or simply because of the geographic region they are, they are based in. So uh, we um, have a program that we call STRIDE, and it, it, it stands for Sustainable Transformative Initiative for Development, and I had to learn that by heart, which is helping uh, farmers in India, Pakistan, and uh, the Philippines to get access to better innovative technologies for crop protection so that they can increase their productivity in a, in a sustainable way. So we're doing this through technology transfers, through education, through community initiatives, such as uh, what we call the productivity challenges that have proved very useful to actually increase yields. And, and so this we, we believe this will have a direct impact on more than 175,000 farmers in three years. So this is one example. But, Technology is very important, but it's not enough. We all know that they also, um, smallholder farmers and farmers in general struggle to get access to finance. For example, in Brazil, it is estimated that only 20 to 30% of farmers actually have access to credit. And those who, who do have access are, let's say, evaluated on the basis of their um, risk. So only those who have low risk get the funds. So we are partnering in Brazil with a fintech, with a startup called uh, um, Strive, no, Tribe with a T, which actually um, uses amazing technology to, to put together the capital and the market. So it evaluates a number of conditions. It uses technology to actually be able to, to identify the real conditions and the, 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 the real uh, possibilities of farmers so they get much better access. And we are currently, or they are currently uh, doing uh, tests in Brazil to be able to scale up. So this is really something which we believe will be very impactful. Um, and maybe the last example, I, I don't know how much time I still have, but um, I mentioned, or I may not have mentioned that we also, um, have very interesting precision agriculture tools in our company. And this is very important because today with climate change, conditions are changing and, and farmers don't really know what will happen. Even seasons are changing. And just like any of us in any business or organization need to have information to be able to do analysis and prediction, farmers need that too. So we have a technology that is called Farm Arc Intelligence, which basically allows uh, growers to know what pest pressure, what pest, what infestation will come even a week in advance. And this uses information that's coming from smart traps or from drones, and then it's analyzed through artificial intelligence, and then they know what will happen. So this allows them to use much less input in a more concrete and precise way, in not only crop protection inputs, but they, they use less water and the on-farm emissions also are reduced. So we are, um, we are um, uh, implementing this technology in countries around the world, including Cameroon, Burkina Faso, South Africa, India, Pakistan, um, Indonesia, Philippines, Mexico, and Colombia. So in all these regions, and these are all countries under the scope of the, of the Zero Hunger Pledge. And uh, we will be doing this until 2030, which we hope will be extremely impactful. So I will stop here. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. You're not only bringing the money, but you're bringing also the topic on artificial intelligence and agriculture on the table, which is taking more and more uh, space in the discussion. And perhaps one point, and Agnes, we had the ESA meeting, and which was mentioned also, we are speaking about transforming food systems, but at the end, it starts with the transforming of the agricultural 
production system at the end. And I think this is also perhaps in the discussions we had here, something perhaps we missed a little bit. We need perhaps more because food system starts with the agricultural production system to, to build this link. And I think therefore your examples are, are nicely fitting. So I will stop to speak. Very happy to get any question or remark also from, from all here participating to the panelists um, and, and on the Zero Hunger Pledge. Yeah, please, and present you very quickly also, and try to keep your question short because we don't know when Beth is arriving. When Beth is, we stop all when Beth is arriving. Hi, I'm Kim Schopping, and I work for Rainforest Alliance. Um, and thanks for your very interesting presentation. Um, so actually, I, it's it's a nice follow up to your remark on changing production system because that's what we what we work on. Um, and um, I have a question for the for the panelists, especially um, OCP and FMC, um, because what we see is that um, companies like yours are very uh, eager and enthusiastic in developing uh, new solutions to, uh, to make the transition possible. Um, what we also see is that um, it's more difficult to, um, to reduce products that you're selling that are actually a barrier for the transition. So some of the products that you are selling um, have been have done have, have been impactful in the past, but have shown that there are negative consequences for uh, the environment um, or the health of, of farmers and their communities. So my question to you is, um, in addition to, to developing new solutions that we need, are you also planning to reduce uh, the sales of those products? Please, Gabriel. Happy to start. Thank you very much for your question. You touched on a very important and fundamental point and almost the elephant in the room. Uh, so as far as we are concerned, we are very much aware of the impact of, of uh, let's say, uh, crop protection products on, on the environment. And we actually have a tool that we call the sustainability tool that analyzes every new product that we develop. And it has to be sustainable. Uh, based based on these standards, so this means that it has to improve the 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 impact in at least one area and doesn't have to decrease, let's say, the positive impact in any other area. So we take this very very seriously. We are working on 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 having all our products being sustainable. Of course, I mean we are talking both about chemical and biological products. Uh, so you know th these these are needed. What we advocate for is an integrated pest management system, which actually uses the, the necessary quantities. And, and we, we are developing a lot of very interesting things in the biological space, which are absolutely um, sustainable, like uh, pheromones to be used uh, uh, widely and so on. So we are, we are working uh, very seriously on, on that topic. Thank you very much for your question. Thanks so much, Gabriel. Leonardo. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think it's, a, it's an important one on this uh, food transformation, that uh, the food system transformation that we are bringing. When we talk about the four R's, first of, first of all, so when we talk about nutrients, we have to understand that uh, sometimes uh, we talk as if it was a bad thing. But nutrients, we are only here because we have excess of nutrients. If we don't have them, we die. So when, when we talk, and then it's also very important to separate the nutrients because they have different uh, components, right? The nitrogen goes to the atmosphere, phosphorus, it does not go. But the thing is, when we have uh, the issues, when we have issues with them, it's because we are using them on the wrong way. So if we use them on the right way, they are a source of soil health, plant health, and one health. Agriculture is a mass balance. You cannot only remove things if you don't feed them. So we have also to feed the soils. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, we, this is why we are advocating pushing hard for the four R's. It's an important four R's. It's using the nutrients on the right way, right source, right timing, and right placement. When you use them on the right way, and then one of the R's is right rate. If you don't need all of this, well, if you're applying, you're applying in the wrong way. So it's because we, it's not walking there, we are bringing them. But this is why we are doing all this. So only in Africa, more than 30 million hectares map now. So the farmers, they can know what they need. And then when they know what they need, so they can bring the nutrients on the right way. And this is what is going to allow us, again, one third of the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture is from uh, uh, deforestation. The single most important solution to fight deforestation in Africa in the next two decades, it's closing yield gaps. We will never be able to close yield gaps if we don't bring the right nutrients. So then everything that we have been advocating is very much aligned with that. So we are advocating for the correct use to decrease 
the greenhouse gas emissions because then plants, we're gonna feed them. So they're gonna be absorbing all these nutrients and then feeding us, feeding the whole ecosystem. So we are very much aligned when we are developing these technologies on the precision agriculture as well, how to provide these nutrients on the better way and timing that the plants they need. And thank you very much for the question. Yeah, I think it's good. We need to be challenged. Huh? I could add, we need also the right seeds. Huh? We didn't speak about seeds, but that's, a, that's another topic. Diane, perhaps you had a question? Please. It wasn't so much a question, Michael, as really recognizing, I think particularly in the moment of this food system stock take, the plus two that we have here, to acknowledge the progress that's being made. I've been listening to Ian Leonardis and Gabrielle, and in fact, many of the other companies who are here in the room have been speaking over the course of these last few days, and we have such tremendous progress that's been made. I think it's important that we recognize that and really think through how it's in service to the countries, because of course here we're really prioritizing the country pathways and what we need to do to really support success in these exact types of locations, like we have such clear examples on. Those linkages are what's going to help us make by plus four really meaningful, measurable progress. And that's the point that we need to continue to drive is how are we measuring that? And that's why this topic in particular today on accountability and benchmarking, how we measure what that performance looks like is going to continue to be really, really important. So knowing that we're working on what that looks like, both quantitatively with the World Benchmarking Alliance and others, but also qualitatively measuring this type of innovation, measuring the type of investment, thinking about how it integrates into the other UN moments where we can integrate the success of and the role of food systems in solving, such as the work leading into COP28 on investment and innovation. These are really key moments and I'm really happy to see everybody who's here working together on this and the messages that we bring back on both holding ourselves as private sector and non-state actors very much accountable to show progress, but doing it in service of the country outcomes that we need to have as well. I think that's an absolutely critical point. And, and yeah, there were remarks on the accountability of, of the private sector. And I think at the same time, and I think therefore it's also so important that we can really link also for instance, what you're doing in Brazil with the national pathway, what is done there. I think that's also where the, the, the Zero Hunger Pledge, I hope, can help to bridge all the initiatives we have, because I think that too many initiatives also from the private sector still out there and the national conveners are not even aware. I think that bridge building should be perhaps in, how you call it, UNFS plus four, be part of the whole stuff. May I, and Michael, excuse me, I just jump in one more time, because the point of having this anchor on the yeah. zero hunger pledge is so important, because even now, too often in our conversations on food systems and agricultural transformation, the aspect of nutritious, sufficient food and addressing both hunger and health still isn't sufficiently incorporated. And that is something that we uniquely only do here. And so continuing to lift that piece and making the correlations like Leonardis and Gabriella just did is super, super important all the way through to the human health benefits. So just thanking for this conversation here and how we continue to lift that. Yeah, thanks Diane for, for your remark. Any, any other question from, from the floor? Yeah, please, and present yourself. Thank you. I'm uh, Katarina Eriksson. Um, I work with Tetra Pak Food for Development. Um, to Tetra Pak. No, 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 no. This is directed to the other two speakers, I, I, I guess. <laughs> uh, no, I, I wanted to uh, to pick up on something that Leonardo just uh, just just said about it's the importance of using products in the right way technical assistance. So I know what we do, uh, providing technical assistance to the dairy value chain uh, so that. Uh, milk is produced in a more efficient way and of course obviously uh, uh, hopefully uh, processed and packed with using our, our, our assistant but we have I mean th that's the team I work for we have these technical assistant resources sometimes we do this um, ourselves working with customers and their value chains or with partners so so I'm interested to know um, uh, the other speakers and your companies uh, and and the products that you have do you also and maybe maybe uh, Gabriela partly answered answered this you said you were going going to with, with this the pledge that you're now making um, but how do you work with technical assistance or partners or yourself to make sure that the value chains of your customers and the way they use your products that 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 they get them 
the most for the buck and, and that it's done uh, in, in, in the most sustainable way poss possible. H how do you find partners or work yourself in, in, in this field? Thank you very much. So uh, on our side, this is always a big challenge, right? So then uh, how to, to get the, 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 the correct thing through. Uh, uh, farmers, of course, it's uh, you have to learn how to communicate with them as well. So it's a, it's a different sometimes language, and then it differs from where you are. In this sense, so we have uh, we have been developing many like technologies. OCP, we develop. We have a whole university that it's an eight years old university that we, we we launched. As part of this university, we have also like in our ecosystem, we have uh, African Plant Nutrition Institute. We just last year they did more than eleven thousand field trials all across the continent. Uh, we get these people going and launching projects all around the continent, but as well as as well as as a company, we have some other good projects like the Agri Booster, the School Lab, uh, we have the, the uh, um, Truck Lab. So we have like trucks. They are. They have uh, labs in Beb, so they go all around the continent doing soil analysis for the farmers. So it's spreading the right way of doing the recommendation of using the products. But we have some very interesting things, which I think is the hub. In this hub, we use like expert farmers. So then the other farmers they can go into this hub and talk with other farmers. They have uh, technical assistance if they want as well. They can use uh, cell phones. They can connect with the others. But in this hub. They can connect and learn from the others what they are doing and then seeing what uh, what they have been uh, how they have been applying how these have been improving their not only productivity but the nutritious aspect when we bring our customized solutions we are bringing not only uh, phosphorus nitrogen the other ones we bring micronutrients because you know they are important and once you bring zinc for example you improve zinc in the grains and then you solve health uh, issues with uh, with the population then we are having some increase in production more than 200 percent which is again improving, optimizing all the use across water, land, and everything that we are doing. So I think using the farmers, like selecting these important farmers, like creating these hubs, it's I think it's a successful story that we are we have been seeing all, all around the, the continent. But of course, it differs. You're, if you are in Brazil or in North America, it's going to be different approaches. But this is using the farms themselves. And as uh, the, just to, to finalize, so we are also launching in the continent, but elsewhere, we are going to have 14 experimental farms all around the continent. And then the idea is that in these experimental farms, we're going to bring the products, test them, adapt them, and launch them on the best way uh, so then that we can show the farmers how, the, how, how it works. So then they can see and then adapt the, the technology and use them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't have a university, but we we work extremely closely with uh, the farmers all around the world. I mean, our our sector is one of the most regulated sectors ever. I believe it's more regulated even than farm and rightly so, correct? Because our products are only safe if used as intended. So we have a label, it has to be exactly follow the instructions. It can cannot be used for any other crop or in any other way. So we, we call this stewardship. We have teams in every single country where we work dedicated to working with farmers, to helping them, educating them exactly on how to use the product safely. It's very challenging because I believe, as Leonardo mentioned, it's, it's, there, there are lots of um, cultural components. So I, I remember a colleague of mine telling me that um, he was going to, to a farmer and he, he saw that he was applying uh, crop protection products without uh, gloves and without the right equipment. And when he pointed out to that, the, the farmer said, well, if I do that, my, my friends next door in the other farms will laugh at me. So, you know, there's still a lot of work to do um, in that sense, but we, we take it, this extremely seriously and we work in every single country, every single program, the, everything I've mentioned includes this stewardship component to, to actually um, help farmers use the products in, in the right way. Thanks so much. So um, I just got information. Beth cannot come. Oh. I, I got a WhatsApp message, but I will read to you her message to you. <laughs> and, and we have just quickly two questions and then we stop. And then because we would like to enjoy really our so Agnes presence here and, and her, her thoughts, perhaps also remarks on the private sector, which we should do more even very quickly. And then uh, we go then. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Cameron. Uh, I work for Nestle, and I'd like to say a word about accountability. Uh, for me, for the longest time, accountability 
begins with transparency. <clears throat> now, when I heard that response about the uh, question that came from behind on Rainforest Alliance, kind of thinking, yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, the challenge around, will you increase the sales of bio benign products? Uh, will the sales of your uh, fossil fuel heavy or chemically based uh, uh, inputs decrease? This is a great question, but I don't know that you should necessarily be expected to set a target in that. But I do think on the spirit, in the spirit of transparency, you should be really transparent about where your revenues are coming from. And I don't just point that at the input providers. I point it at the food companies in the room. So Nestle now reports on the proportions of its portfolio that come from Health Star rating 1.5 and below, 1.5 to 3.5, 3.5 and above on what's outside of the Health Star rating system. That's transparency. And as a result of that, we can be held to account for where our revenues come from. I know that Unilever, who's also in the room, has got a similar sort of model, not exactly the same, but that level of transparency, mm. broadly speaking, is, is equivalent. Mm. And I'd respectfully request that if we want to be in these rooms, that all food companies should show a similar level of transparency, because it's only through transparency that true accountability can be arrived at. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks for this um, statement. Please, last question. Thank you. Um, first, congratulations to the presenters. I really enjoyed your, your interventions. My name is Wayne Ellis. I'm the executive director of the Sustainable Rice Platform. And I, I haven't heard rice mentioned once in this conversation today. Despite I'm the happy fact, to raise it if you want. Despite the, fight, the fact that, despite the fact that rice feeds half the world. So no conversation on um, um, food systems transformation can be complete without a discussion of interventions in rice. So to make it very short, my, my question goes to um, FMC and, uh, and OCP. Um, what kind of proportion of your interventions, I mean, how are you, how are you approaching um, the rice sector in your, in your respective interventions? This is also an invitation, I guess. The Sustainable Rice Platform is in a global alliance of 110 members spanning the stakeholder spectrum. Um, we bring together partners, um, including the input supply companies, um, uh, to bring integrated pest management uh, into play. Um, we also work with the Sustainable Rice and help to found the Sustainable Rice Landscapes Initiative with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And some of the partners are here today, Victoria and Diane. Um, really good to see you here. So, um, you know, that actually extends the reach of this, of this uh, initiative through partners such as UNEP, FAO, IRI, and GIZ as well. So we'd like to scale up these kinds of tools that we've developed, voluntary standards and so on. Um, but we do need the support and the, and the participation of the corporate sector um, uh, in collaboration with civil society and research. So we'd be really um, pleased to have you join as members. Thank you. Thanks for this important call, Gabriel. Very quickly, huh? Because yes, and I'm really yeah. sorry I cannot look at you while I speak, but uh, I, I would be delighted to to follow up this conversation. I think your your work is extremely important. Rice is is something which is very important in diets all around the world, but it's also part of the livelihood of countries like West Africa, for example, with whom we are supporting some initiatives, and I will be happy to share with you um, offline. So thank you very much said the same so we'll be glad to, to continue the discussions but for us it's really uh, most of the time when we are discussing is that we, we are driven by the countries themselves so just an example like in Ghana so what we, we do there it's like corn and rice because then the countries uh, it's interested in, in developing these uh, food systems so it's uh, really more country thanks for this call we I see there would be quite more questions but now we have also Agnes here and we would like to, to listen to her before I would like, again, apologize that Beth is not coming with us. She would like to thank you really um, her support on these partnerships, you know, her engagement in collaboration with the private sector. I think that's her top priority. And therefore she would have loved to be here to express it also. Um, she's supporting us and she wanted to announce you also to give you the latest figure because before Agnes started, we didn't give you the latest figure. Today in the pledge we have, it's nearly 560 million or is it 560 million? Um, US dollars. I think it's fantastic to see 46 companies. I think that's really great to see. 
and we are not at the end of the story, I imagine. Um, and, and therefore, with this, um, I think it's it's really a big pleasure, Agnes, to have you here. Uh, also, as yeah, Agra, all what you're doing with Agra, but also in your functions at the UN Food System Summit, all this. And I think it's very important to listen to you. Also, perhaps what you heard here, perhaps you have remarks or concerns um, um, to move us through. Thanks again, Agnes, for being with us. Thank you, and uh, I just wanted to start by appreciating all the partners that worked with us to put this together. It's really, really important to keep ensuring that we have all the voices around the table when it comes to food systems transformation. More, more importantly, it's really critical to have uh, private sector voices, because again, you guys are the shakers and movers of the food system. So. What you do is extremely important uh, to driving the food, the right things in the food system, but sometimes the wrong things as well, right? So, but let's focus on the right things because that's where we are going. The zero hunger pledge that we talked about here, we've emphasized the two elements, the hunger and the health, but there's also the health of the environment. So we can't feed people and not and really appreciate the place and role of the environment. And that has to be critical. We really need to ask ourselves, how did we get here? So every time we need to keep asking ourselves, how did we get here? So, but we are here and we need to overcome this moment. And to be able to overcome this moment will depend on how well we go forward. And like people are saying in, in the plenary, it all starts now. So for me, the countdown is not so much that we came here to see, and I love the fact that you're talking about 460 million, right? But the moment, the critical moment is that going forward, when we come back here, we don't have three companies reporting. We actually do have a huge report, and I'm sure there's that type of report. We have a huge report that is showing us where everybody's at on accountability, on um, the, the, how, what you're doing to feed people and on how we are balancing uh, feeding people with health. So really, really good work that is going on. Wanted to appreciate the efforts, but I also wanted to raise two things. When I listen to you all, um, I still hear that we are doing this, we are doing this, which is great. But I also want to say that we are not scaling fast enough. So what can we do to scale fast enough? I, I honestly think that one of the weaknesses I still see in the food system conversations is how much we're not taking advantage of each other. Mm. As Agra, I'll say, I said it last night, Rob, and, 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 uh, and uh, I'll say it today, and other institutions, there are some of us, and I see GF here, there are some of us whose job is to put public resources, to make public resources work for the things that we do. But it would be, wouldn't it go so much further if those public resources were linked with private sector resources, not all of us going in 101 different directions. So I listen to you and I'm like, you have an institute which is doing so much work. You have so much um, work that is, so many people that are in, on the ground working. And then we do have this, thing of developing our dealership networks in the field where we are concerned about how SMEs in Africa take seeds and fertilizers to farmers and we are building these networks and they are struggling to get capital, they are struggling to get, what is it called, uh, inventory. And you guys are sitting with inventory that they can use, right? So how do you take advantage of what we do and we take advantage of what we do? Um, so that's that's where I see that we really need to work stronger together. Private, public and private sector money needs to work better together. It's just not happening enough. And there's, from where I'm sitting, I just see there's so much resources, so much money out there, but it's not coming together the right way. Just so much fra fragmentation, resources going in different directions. They are now, we, through the, the um, well, Food Market Alliance, which Diane knows very well, the number of you that are members of the Food Market Alliance. We now have this farmer service center work going on. 
where many of you as businesses are bringing some of your best knowledge and putting it in these pharma service centers so that it can become available locally, as many that can become available locally. We would be interested to invest in those, expand them, ensure that every farmer gets rich. Let me tell you something. It's not good enough to reach 100,000 farmers. It's not good enough to reach 2 million farmers. It's not good enough to reach 5 million farmers because someone somewhere is going hungry. We need to reach everyone. And the only way we can reach everyone is when we work together. So for me, there's nothing ever, uh, and, and my teams know this, there's nothing that is ever good enough if it is not scale. If we're not talking about scale, at least go as far as you can. Because it's only then you can satisfy yourself that you're doing the most you can to reach the most people you can. And it's not about your money. It's not about your capacity. It's about our money. It's about our capacity. It's about our collective ability. And we need to harness it. So I, I just wanted to make sure that um, you do know that there are many of us out there in the public space that are dying for opportunities to support you as private sector, <laughs> to work and work with farmers out there and make it possible. So I really want to end on that note. Again, want to thank you all and want to thank you, Diane, for your leadership here and for really being able to bring us together. I want to thank you for supporting the work of the summit so far. And I really want to tell you that I'm excited to see what the next two years will look like. Because here we've been building the, the base, right? We do have so many instruments now. We do have so many things you've all tested. The next two years are going to be very critical because it's, it all starts now, number one, we don't have a choice. Number two, we have so much to do together. So I think it's something that is going to be very exciting. And then, just then, 2030 might be possible after all, if we continue chipping away at this huge block that we are dealing with. So thank you again for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think your call for co-creation, that's absolutely taken up by the, by the private sector. We need to go um, further in this direction. And therefore also we need to think about these national pathways, how we can bridge at the national world, but also public sector, private sector, and CGIRs and others in the private sector. I think, again, thanks for, uh, Agnes, for your important word. Thanks also to the speakers. Thanks to the participants. Apologize if not everybody could ask the question. Um, but you know the time frame. I think we have yet to run to other meetings um, with this. In two years, it will be perhaps the number will be higher, but we need also the concrete <laughs> impacts, uh, and it will be, be higher. very clear. People. <laughs> let's be very clear. People. We have each other. The numbers must be higher. That's our pledge okay. to each other, right? <laughs> yeah. Tetra Pak is ready, perhaps. Huh? <laughs> Thank you so much, and see you all. Huh? <laughs>